taking this country forward. I call the honourable member Kemujit Bakshi. Satsuri Akal. Satsuri Akal, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to stand and support this bill on third reading. Mr. Speaker, this government has got a very focused growth agenda. We are ensuring that this economy should grow and jobs are created for the New Zealanders. I agree with Andrew Williams that we need infrastructure, we need uh, schools, roads, all those things. And this government has been working on this for the last four or five years. And I can assure you that uh, this will continue and we will support all the job opportunities being created. I commend this bill to the House, Mr. Speaker. I call the Honourable Member Andrew Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I once again rise to speak on the Crown Minerals Amendment Act 2013 Amendment Bill. Uh, so I'd like to invoke our good and well-loved and uh, late friend Patakura Hotamia, who, when asked uh, early in his political career in the House about a particular piece of legislation on a very important and topical issue of the day, responded in terms that were regarded then as parliamentary, so hopefully they'll be regarded as parliamentary today. But he said he wanted a piece of legislation that could not be frigged around with. And, sir, what has happened with this legislation is completely the opposite. We haven't had a good quality piece of legislation, and it has been frigged around with, and yet again we are asked to do exactly that today, because this government cannot and will not get it right. And uh, we are in the extraordinary situation of having a reasonably comprehensive amendment bill to an amendment act that has itself not yet taken effect. And if that doesn't tell you about the quality of the management of legislation through this House, then, sir, I'm not quite sure what will. So earlier in this uh, third reading debate, uh, Jonathan Young said that the changes in this bill are necessary for health and safety in the industry. Well, that is just patently not correct. And the thing about that is that this government has finally taken, started to take health and safety seriously. It could not do anything other than that. It had the Pike River Royal Commission saying that things are in a parlour state and something has to change. It had its own committee, chaired by the uh, very good, the very great Rob Jager, himself the head of an oil company in this country, Shell Oil New Zealand, uh, who recommended radical change to our health and safety approach. Nothing in this bill is going to make a single bit of difference to health and safety. We need a comprehensive approach to it, and if anything, what this bill will do is make it worse. Because the health and safety oversight required under the now, I have to get this right, uh, not the primary legislation, but the amendment act that we are now amending, the health and safety oversight provided for in the amendment act is itself pretty weak, is pretty light. It simply requires the minister to be satisfied that it is likely that a permit applicant can, has, has the technical capability and the financial means to do the job. There's no, there's no objective standard to it, and it, of course it requires the minister uh, merely to be satisfied. And that is a pretty low standard. With all due respect uh, to the members in this House, that is a pretty low standard in reality. And what this bill then does is split that up. It says, listen, whereas before the minister had to be satisfied about technical capability and financial means throughout the entire process up to exploration drilling, now we'll split that up. And we'll say, listen, if you've got the technical capability and the financial means for the uh, prospecting aspect of it, oh, we'll just let you go then and come back to us for the next bit. And then all of a sudden what apparently this bill contemplates is that if the Halliburtons and the Schlumbergers and the Shells, when they've got their initial permit and their satisfaction as to technical and financial capability, they come back and say, that's it, there's barrels under there, we're in... We're in uh, the, the, the golden, uh, the, the black gold is going to flow. We want to come back for the rest of it. Apparently now the minister is going to be able to stand up and say, uh-uh, you've got now got to show me a second round of technical and financial capability. And there is just no way on the track record of this government 
that we can be sure that any minister in this government is going to be able to stand up to a Schlumberger, a Shell or a Halliburton and say, oh no, you've got to stop what you're doing now because uh, you've got to have better than what you've got now, even though I proved it last time. That is incredible. So what this bill does is weakens that level of oversight at a time when we are meant to be being convinced that this government is taking health and safety seriously. This goes in totally the opposite direction. And that's why it's wrong, and that's why we're opposing it. Uh, Mr Lotto Oenga, uh, in his uh, speech, said that it was all about providing jobs. Trotted out the old, the repeated assertion that, that parties in opposition don't want jobs for people, which is completely ridiculous. He might want to know this, and Jonathan Young knows this as well as I do, is that we've had probably the best summer of oil exploration and oil industry activity in many years in Taranaki in the summer just gone. And you know what the most recent employment statistics show? Unemployment in Taranaki went up by 500. In the last 500. 500 more jobless in Taranaki in the last year after the best summer season of oil industry activity we've seen in many years. This is not the panacea. This is not the great uh, rainbow uh, uh, with the, the gold at the end of the rainbow that this government trots out. Let's do this activity because, yes, uh, we have the, there is uh, the possibility uh, of generating some value. But this is not the answer to New Zealand's long-term economic structural problems. And we've got to get past that. And until we have people in office, in government, on the Treasury benches, who understand that New Zealand has deep-seated, long-term structural economic problems and are prepared to do something about it, then life ain't going to be too good for us in five, ten years' time. And this isn't going to cure it. This is not the cure. But while we have an oil and gas industry, and while we have uh, ministers who have responsibility for providing oversight, then the least I think New Zealand expects is that we will operate to world's best practice. This bill will not do that. It does the opposite. It's a highly subjective approach, a highly subjective test that will not ensure that we have the best possible, not only health and safety, but, us, but also environmental standards operating when it comes to oil and gas, both prospecting and exploration. And then the other insidious aspect of this bill as, it, as the conceit in it is this attempt to legislate for something that we simply don't know we have the power to legislate for, and that is control or management of all the water above the continental shelf. We've had evidence before this House in this urgent procedure that suggests that it is hugely doubtful about whether we can even pass this law, or at least pass a law and, and hope that it has meaningful effect. We, won't ha we don't have a response from the Minister, Minister sat in the chair all through the committee stages, didn't respond to a single point that was raised, legitimate points, backed up by evidence. We haven't had the benefit of a select committee process where we can call upon the, uh, the officials and professionals and independent advisers. We haven't had the benefit of that. And we are ramming this through roughshod, as uh, Mr Hanade was concerned to hear earlier in this debate. It is being rammed through roughshod. And he knows what that is. He would have seen that a few, time, a few times in his time as a union official, I know, because in his day, when he was a union official, ramming things through roughshod was the only way they did things. When I was a union official in the democratic days of the union movement, and things were all sweetness and light, and it was good, and it was good, and we did good things. We did good things just after, just after Tohenare me. That's right. So, sir, it is not possible. That's right. Wore the leather jackets up to the master point order finding. We know how it operated. And that, was, and that was just for the clerical workers. We know how it worked. So, sir, we are concerned. We did good things. And the, and the, uh, the, the union members of Taranaki, including the bits of Taranaki that didn't fall on the members opposite Shane O'Dan's electorate, uh, they were happy people and good people. People who worked at Motunui and the Waitra Valley plant. In the, days, in the days when it fell in a different electorate, but it's in New Plymouth now and it's rightful place. And, uh, and things are going well. But, sir, we are opposed to this legislation, sir, because it, doesn't, it treats with contempt uh, the people in the oil and gas industry, particularly those who are working and at the coal face and doing the dangerous work. It treats with contempt those who, are, who wish to exercise their right to dissent to activities that are happening and, and raise a voice of protest. It treats with contempt the very members of this House. 
and the law-making procedures that we are elected to do and to fulfil in good faith and with proper information and good process. It treats all of that with contempt. It is a bad bill. It is a wrong bill. And uh, this will be a day of shame for this House when this bill goes through. Well done. Good speaker. I call the honourable member Young Ken. Thank you, Mr.